there's certainly a lot to say. So, uh, and I'll keep it short. He's trained as a mathematician, got his PhD at the uh, University of Maryland in 64. Uh, did a short stint at Berkeley as a postdoc, followed by 20 odd years of being a prof at Cornell. Uh, and since 1992, um, he's been the James S. McDonald Distinguished Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology um, at Princeton and the, center of, and the director for the Center of Biocomplexity. Um, lots of honors, I could say. Uh, so I'm only going to say three. Um, the National Medal of Science, most um, most recent big one uh, in the States, um, as well as the Kyoto Prize for Basic Science. And as any uh, distinguished ecologist should have the Robert MacArthur Award. Um, out of that uh, lecture came a real banger of a paper that I'm sure all the ecologists in the crowd will know. Um, the problem of pattern and scale in ecology. Um, and I've been told that Simon doesn't like long introductions, so uh, I'll stop it there and just say uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes. It's great too. I, um, I love Montreal. I wish I were uh, up there in person, but thanks for sitting with me um, as, as we go through this. So my late colleague, um, uh, Phil Anderson, he was a professor at Princeton and a Nobel laureate, the paper in 1972, which I think everybody should read. It's called More is Different. It was really directed at his physicist uh, colleagues uh, to let them know that just knowing what all the parts were in the system um, would be like just knowing all the nouns in a sentence and none of the verbs and and didn't allow you to reconstruct what was going on. That The reductionist view had its limits. He said the ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws doesn't imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. Uh, a few years later, and independently, another Nobel laureate, Francois Jacob, a biologist, published a paper in science. And this is another paper that uh, I insist my students read. It's called Evolution and Tinkering. It's a, a beautiful paper. Uh, and, and in this, he says, first of all, that we must analyze complex objects at all levels. But secondly, um, it is a point concerning predictability. Can we make predictions at one level on what we know going on at lower levels? And he says only to a limited extent. The properties of a system can be explained by the properties of its components, but they can't be deduced from them. In other words, starting from the fundamental laws of physics, there's no way of reconstructing the universe. I don't know whether he read Anderson's paper, basically the same point though. And finally, another great uh, biologist, uh, Ed Wilson, um, in in one of his final works, the book Consilience, which sits on my shelf, uh, urged for a science of consilience, bringing together different disciplines where similar problems um, were, were being confronted. Uh, he seemed to suggest a fundamental role for mathematics because he said math, because of its effectiveness in the natural sciences, seems to point arrow-like towards the goal of objective truth. But he went on to say, uh, it, First of all, he, he also referred to this famous paper of Wigner's, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. But uh, he seemed unconvinced because he argued that this was logical positivism, namely the notion that philosophical problems that were worth studying could be, or just those that were subject to logical analysis. Uh, and, and then he snarkily said, that's more commonly studied in philosophy like dinosaurs are studied in paleontology so we can understand the causes of extinction. And then he wrote a famous uh, essay um, in the Wall Street Journal in which he said, um, just look at the last line, um, I have a secret to share. Many of the most successful scientists in the world today are mathematically no more than semi-literate. Basically what he said in the article is mathematics is important, but you could always find a mathematician to do that job for you. Well, I'm going to argue uh, against that. I'm going to argue that math is indeed the unifying discipline for Wilson's consilience because it helps us to grapple with the things that I think no matter what problems we're working on, we all confront. Uh, namely, we're dealing with what are called complex adaptive systems. I'll say more about them, but it basically makes, 
means systems that are made up of a lot of independent components. So it helps us to grapple with complex adaptive systems and the emergence that um, Anderson and Jacob were talking about, and, and to relate the reductionistic and holistic perspectives in order to understand a whole bunch of things. How do we scale from, from one level to another, emergence, pattern formation, critical transitions, and conflicts between the interests of individuals and the collective goods. And I will touch on all of these things today. I wanna to explore the role of mathematics in addressing what I spent a lot of my time on, the fundamental issue of our time, namely, how do we achieve a sustainable future for our children and our grandchildren? I'm gonna argue that sustainability of the biosphere is actually the ultimate global challenge for consilience uh, research. This is uh, a UN uh, poster. Um, so let me get started with uh, the details. Ecosystems and the biosphere, the things I work on, are complex adaptive systems. That means they're heterogeneous collections of individual agents that interact with each other locally uh, and evolve. And I don't mean um, in, in the genetic sense necessarily. They change, and so this is the mathematical sense, based on the outcomes of those interactions. But it could be behavioral changes uh, etc. Um, but not only the ecological systems, socioeconomic systems with which they are intertwined and which we have to confront if we're um, trying to deal with sustainability, those are also complex adaptive systems, uh, also made up of individual agents. The fundamental macroscopic properties of the biosphere, things like species abundance distributions, energy flow, nutrient cycling, and ecosystem services, the services that humans derive from um, natural systems, all of these are emergent from lower level interactions, but they are macroscopic properties. And the problem we have to face is just like the problem is, um, my late colleague Ken Arrow, the great economist pointed out to me that it's no accident that economics and ecology both start with eco, they mean the same thing. It means the house, um, but they deal with different aspects of it. And if, if, you conf if you examine economics textbooks, you will find this duality between the microeconomics and the macroeconomics, just like we're confronting it with the micro features and not necessarily things you need to see in a microscope, but lower level features and microscopic emergent properties. And it's the interaction between these that that's crucial to approach and to, to understand how the system's working. This uh, is true if you're working on the immune system, as we do to some extent, if you're working on um, uh, epidemics and pandemics and populations in relation to the infection of, um, of individual agents, um, even if you're working on complex adaptive materials, <clears throat> you'll have the relationship between uh, the individual molecules, for example, and the statistical um, mechanics of the ensembles. So all of this implies a need to relate phenomena across scales. In my case, from cells to organisms, from organisms to groups of organisms, collectives, from them up to e and to ask questions like, how robust are the properties of ecosystems? How does the robustness of the macroscopic properties relate to ecological? Logical and evolutionary dynamics on finer scales? Are ecosystems at critical points? And how do we manage the commons across scales and conflicts of interest? And for those of you who are working on different systems, you could have exactly this same list, just replacing the word ecosystems by whatever your system is, um, because they're collective phenomena that are going on. And I, in a different lecture, I could give you long lists of things like bacterial biofilms and other um, issues in which um, individuals work together, not necessarily knowingly, uh, in order to produce collective outcomes, which are important properties of the system. Um, and um, I, I will, and it's the statistical mechanics of those ensembles that's important. So to simplify it from a mathematical point of view, I'm gonna talk about three things. The first is emergence and pattern formation, topics that have been of central interest in theoretical biology since uh, uh, long before I got involved in the field and that 
<clears throat> is more than 50 years ago. Uh, robustness, in particular robustness of those patterns and critical transitions between states and cooperation and collective intelligence. So these are the three parts of the lecture that I want to go into. So let's start with emergence. Um, sustainability really has to focus on the macroscopic features of the system. For example, the ecosystem services we derive from it, while recognizing that control of those rests at lower levels of organization in the same way that in studying thermodynamics, uh, one um, physicist long ago developed the statistical mechanics to allow us to understand how, how liquids under that are being heated or uh, gases under pressure, et cetera, um, eventually transitions, the behavior of these. When you you don't think about this, if usually when you put a, a pot of water on the, on the stove to, uh, to boil, but you know that when it transforms from one state to another, a so-called phase transition, this is the result of large numbers of uh, independent molecules that are interacting with each other. Um, and so you're interested in the macroscopic properties, but deep down, you know that this emerges from lots of interactions at lower levels. Well, we've developed, and when I say we, this is the royal way, um, ways to, to do this same sort of scaling in ecological system. Um, this is work that started with Dan Botkin uh, a long time ago. It was carried on by Hank Shugart, my colleague, Steve Pakala. Um, this is work that we did together here uh, in building forest growth models. These are more complicated kinds of statistical mechanics because the interactions uh, between, in this case, trees are nonlinear. But basically what Pakala and the others had done was to develop models in which individual trees are grown. Um, they shade each other out. They disperse their seeds. Uh, and you can model the system um, based on these sorts of interactions. Uh, and when you do it, you you will get, um, here's a simulation on the right, um, led by my former graduate student, Doug Deutschman, who uh, then um, most recently was a dean at Wilfrid Laurier, and now is just a professor there. Um, and this is a simulation of the different colors represent different trees. Uh, and the model produced results that match quite well with observations. Obviously not endeavoring to, uh, determine what trees will be at what spots because you saw that they move around, but what the relative statistics of the different species of trees are in the plot um, on the average over long periods of time. So one has to understand, take a step back and understand uh, what properties are predictable and what is detail that um, you don't want to predict because um, it, it's a because it's only the statistical properties that are important. Well, these vegetation models have been successful also in extending, explaining global patterns, but here, <clears throat> another, um, one's not trying to predict species abundances, but basically ecotypes, um, you know, where you would find desert, where you would find tundra, where you would find grassland, uh, et cetera. And similar models have been developed for marine systems. We work on some of those, but the um, the most successful models, I think, were led by Mick Follows and his group at MIT. Uh, and uh, the, the mathematical details I'll tell you a little bit about here, but they're not so important for the point I want to make, which is um, his group developed models of nutrients, phytoplankton, zooplankton, the subscripts rep representing different species or different types. Um, the first terms on the right-hand side are uh, simplification, diffusion terms diffusion and advection terms, um, which describe the movement of organisms around the system. You might want more complicated fluid dynamics in these models. Uh, and the terms that, that follow in the green are the uptake terms, the rates at which nutrients are uptake taken by the phytoplankton, that phytoplankton are consumed by zooplankton. Uh, there are no fish in these models yet. There are no viruses in these models, although um, movement is in those directions. Uh, and what follows group did is to put large numbers of these species together and just let them do the simulations, let them sort out, do it multiple times, and then make predictions uh, similar to what I just showed you for the uh, terrestrial vegetation on where uh, one would find different types 
not necessarily species. Pluricoccus, Prochlorococcus is a group of bacterial species, Synecococcus, but diatoms, large eukaryotes, these are even larger groups. And these models are extremely successful at making predictions of where diatoms will be dominant, et cetera, but no attempt to predict where individual species will be found. So there's a problem of scaling here. As you move up to the higher levels, um, you um, need to uh, abstract a bit as to what the, what the types are, and therefore the models we are building now here, led by my postdoc, George Hackstrom, whom I'll mention later, are what we call trait-based models, in which you don't even attempt to keep track of species, but characterize the regions by their um, phenotypic properties. Uh, pattern formation has been one of the central themes of mathematical biology for a long time, ever since Alan Turing um, and, and C.H. Waddington, uh, the great developmental biologist, Turing, obviously the great computer scientist, I'll say a bit more about it, but if you're interested in this topic, I heartily recommend uh, the, the book, and this is the old version of it, by Jim Murray, uh, my colleague who retired to Princeton, so he's right in my area here. Um, but if you're interested in anything in mathematical biology, these are this is a great book or uh, now pair of books because it's a two-volume set now. Uh, and his focus was largely on pattern formation, like the striping patterns that you see on zebras. Or, or 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 the pattern on, on the spot patterns on the necks of, of giraffes, uh, and beginning from the models developed by Alan Turing. Turing's paper in the 50s is, is something that every theoretical biologist reads. It just motivates a lot of work. Um, it's less known probably to others than Turing's other work on cryptography, et cetera, because, um, and, and, and on computer science more generally, um, because he, he got interested in how organisms develop. How is it that a, uh, an individual egg um, without a blueprint develops into you or me or, or the zebras or the giraffes, uh, et, et cetera? And, and he proposed a very simple model for how this would happen. Without a blueprint, with the only external information being gravity, um, he said, imagine that you have two, two chemical species um, what he called morphogens, an activator and an inhibitor, then interact according to those terms F and G, where um, U stimulates the production of not only itself, but the inhibitor, and the inhibitor uh, damps down not only the activator, but also itself. Uh, but suppose that they diffuse at different rates. That's all you need. And he showed that if in the absence of diffusion, you had a, a stable equilibrium between these under certain conditions. The differential diffusion could um, break symmetry and lead to the production of patterns. The idea was that suppose you have an activator and an inhibitor uh, and a sudden blip allows the activator to build up, that stimulates the production of the inhibitor, but if the inhibitor has a higher diffusion rate, it diffuses away and the activator keeps going no longer damped down like it was before. Meanwhile, the inhibitor is places where it shouldn't be, and it damps down the activator, and that breaks symmetry. That's all that Turing did. That was the deep insight. This led to a collaboration that I had with Lee Siegel, uh, and, and the, based, too, on these simulations of Hans Meinhardt working with Alfred Gearer, the developmental biologist, um, showing that the way this could happen was you had a uniform distribution of cells, an initial random perturbation, got reinforced in what they called local activation, long-range inhibition. So that symmetry would be broken, but somehow these patterns would be stabilized on broader scale. To do that, you had to study the nonlinear dynamics, and Lee and I did that uh, and showed that, uh, um, that this could lead to uh, the stabilization of pattern on the broader scales. So that's pattern. Um, there are lots of other models for how pattern can form. The most interesting though, I think still are the Turing models because in the Turing models, pattern forms without any external stimulus. It's just the the instability, the breaking of symmetry and the, and, and the differential diffusion, um, these so-called diffusive instabilities uh, that, that uh, uh, give rise to these broader patterns. But 
patterns can break down. So this turns to the attention of how robust are these patterns? What's the potential for critical transitions from one pattern to another? Stock markets crash and recover. Uh, most famous crash, of course, uh, uh, nearly a century ago, um, the the Great Depression. But we've seen other, uh, in, in 2008, we saw um, the big drops, especially in the U.S. markets. The Canadian markets uh, fared much better because uh, the banking system was more robust, less connected. But that's a another lecture. Critical transitions also occur in physiological states, um, epileptic seizures, migraine headaches, um, atrial fibrillation, uh, and there are early warning indicators of these. That's why we, um, the, the physicians use EKGs and EEGs to, to look at these early warning indicators. Um, and transitions of this sort are, are, are widespread um, and led, the, the person who's written the most about this recently is Martin Scheffer, the, the um, Dutch ecologist, um, who wrote a fine book for uh, Princeton University Press called Critical Transitions in Nature and Society. Most of the book is about natural systems, but there's a lot of interest in uh, transitions and collapses uh, in, uh, in non, um, certainly non-biological systems. So can we read the tea leaves? Are there early warning indicators? Um, and... Um, Scheffer's led a number of papers on anticipating critical transitions, looking at signals um, like, um, um, sorry, um, looking at signals like what's called critical slowing down, the rate at which the system returns to the equilibrium um, it, it begins to become slower, uh, and other features like um, uh, autocorrelation and increased variance um, that are characteristic of certain classes of perturbation. For those of you who were around during the days when catastrophe theory was being introduced and, and the ultimate explanation for everything in the study of transitions and um, especially biological systems, you'll know that that subject was oversold because it oversimplified. It introduced mechanisms that sometimes worked and concluded that the, that they all they always work and want us to be careful um, with the notions of early warning in, indicators of critical tra transitions because all the ones that are generally mentioned like critical slowing down are characteristic of what are called second order transitions I'll come back to that point and not all transitions are second ordered uh, so two of my former students Carl Bodiger now a professor at um, University of California Berkeley. And Alan Hastings, a uh, retired uh, prof emeritus professor at UC Davis, uh, together with their student, Noam Ross, uh, published a series of papers um, that dug more deeply into it. So if you're interested, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but if you're interested in that area, it's extremely uh, hot areas, understanding the mapping between um, the usual measures in um in physical systems uh, and uh, and more general transitions, which generally are not second order phase transitions. Um, in physical systems, phase transitions provide a model like the famous icing model for magnetization, um, it, which is a very simple um, um, perc percolation type model like the voter model in which um, sites are pointing up or down and then influences their neighbors and one gets a collective phenomenon. But many of the early warning indicators suggested, as I said, are characteristic of second order phase transitions, but the transitions that we're seeing in ecological systems, for example, appear to be more like first order. Maybe therefore the mapping to physics is not the right analogy. And with George Hagstrom, whom I mentioned uh, before, who has been my postdoc and research associate, uh, and is on the job market now. So if anybody uh, is looking for a, a great young um, uh, ecologist, a, a George person, um, we published a paper in a book called How Worlds Collapse, uh, in which we try to resolve this paradox uh, and point out that most of these transitions are neither first order nor second order, but uh, closer to what 
in the literature known as spinodal instabilities. So that's a tangent I've gone off on. I won't go more deeply into it. But now I want to turn to the third part of, of, of the lecture, which will take the longest, um, the importance of critical transition for management. And this um, there's an early warning indicator. This uh, gentleman is not doing something wise. Um, <clears throat> there are management challenges, and, and how do we approach those um, um, those challenges? Can we use early? Can we design systems to permanently keep us away from transitions if that's not what we want? By the way, some transitions are good. If you uh, if you're in a recession, you you want to transition back to a healthy economy. Economy. Uh, so can we design systems to keep us in good states? If not, can we develop early warning indicators that tell us when we need to take action? And finally, if we can't do that, as we seem to, the problem we seem to have with climate change, can we develop mitig mitigation and adaptation measures that get back to where we want to be? So there are all those stages along the way. Uh, and th that brings me to the last bullet which is a cooperation and collective intelligence. Um, from microbial systems to socioeconomic systems, we see macroscopic patterns emerging from microscopic interactions. One of the, um, the, the most characteristic cases are the cellular slime molds uh, in which the, 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 the great experimental work was done by another late colleague of mine, John Bonner. He was actually, John Tyler Bonner, he was actually in my department. Who, who studied the uh, the cellular slime mold, which uh, can exist in the state that you see on the left. Well, it can actually exist in a state where the amoebae are all over the place, but at some point when food becomes limiting, they begin to stream together, forming the slugs, which eventually develop into these uh, structures you see on the right, with the spores being included in the bulb at the top and eventually being dispersed. A lot of interesting questions. The first is a question of hemotaxis and pattern formation that my colleague, Lee, who I already mentioned, Lee Siegel, together with Evelyn Keller, studied um, in, in some early uh, classical work in theoretical biology. But then there's another interesting evolutionary question, which is the cells that end up in the stalk aren't reproducing, so they are contributing to a collective good, but making or sacrifice. Why should they? They do that, and John Bonner's uh, spent a lot of work. That um, book that uh, I or paper rather that I mentioned there, the social cell, is one where he lays out those challenges. It might have to do with genetic relatedness, etc. But it's a fascinating system uh, to study uh, emergence, pattern formation, and um, these conflicts. Large animal aggregations emerge from local interactions, like these uh, wildebeest herds. And why do we get these? Um, patterns on the front that look like uh, hydrodynamic instabilities, look like um, a, a uniform front has been uh, broken. So we've also done a lot of work on this. I won't talk about this today. This fantastic picture that many of you are probably seeing of a starling flock organizing themselves in a, to a giant starling uh, sort of points out that um, there are a variety of reasons why animals engage uh, in aggregation and collective behavior. They may include um, foraging for food, I'll come back to that, but they also may include confounding predators, and they may simply be for the purposes of reproduction, essentially single spars. Um, so all of these inescapably lead to conflicts between levels. Why, if you're if you're in that bird flock or in the wildebeest herd, you don't want to be on, on the edge because then you can get picked off by the predators. So why do you contribute to this? How do individuals organize themselves <clears throat> into these collective structures? Uh, this inescapably leads to conflicts between animals, just like in this tumor growth. The tumor cell is growing in the short run um, because it gives it an advantage numerically over the, the normal cells, but ultimately it's going to destroy the host in the same way that we're destroying the planet. There are problems of, of scales of organization and of time scales, but often these get resolved. There are tumor repressing cells and things of that sort. How does this evolve? When does it break down? What can we do about it? 
Uh, and it also points out the need to scale from individuals like in those bird flocks uh, and back. Uh, what you're looking at here, uh, I thank Car Clodo Carari for this, um, is, is and the Star Flag Project, uh, is, is a flock of starlings and one hawk that you can see out there that's driving a lot of this action. And I'll just show you these. My training was in fluid dynamics. And when, when you observe patterns of this sort and lots, I'm turning it off because of the, uh, uh, because of, of the sound there. Um, when you see patterns of this sort, and this has interested large numbers of physicists, it, it naturally su uh, suggests to you um, um, some of the models from fluid dynamics and, uh, and the sort in which one's trying to understand and um, it'll be, uh, emergent behavior from individual interactions. So years ago, Lee, Lee Siegel and I um, thought about the pattern formation that one sees uh, in marine systems and said, maybe that's a Turing type instability where the activators are phytoplankton and, and, the, um, and, and the inhibitors are zooplankton. And my graduate student, Danny Grunbaum, um, his thesis on this topic. But it turned out that although we published a paper in Nature and showed that this was a hypothetical possibility um, and the reason the model was wrong is because it would have predicted that the inhibitors the zooplankton were more smoothly distributed than the phytoplankton and when we looked at the data that's not the case and the reason that's not the case is because zooplankton aren't diffusively moved around, passively moved around. They actively aggregate for some of the reasons you saw in the bird flocks and in the wildebeest herds. It's because there's some collective function there. And so Danny, in his brilliant thesis, set out to develop an appropriate statistical mechanics when the rules of interaction were more complicated, when individuals could react to other individuals in the group, either attracted to them or repelled from them. And so he began from... Uh, Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration, but where the various forces acting were not just the first two, which came from the fluid uh, uh, dynamics, uh, either diffusive motion or uh, advective motion, but also grouping behavior where individuals were attracted to or repelled by other individuals in the group, or what we, and it was really came from Akira Okubo, called a rail in which individuals didn't try to move towards, but tried to align with um, the, the directionality of other individuals. And we've done a lot of work on that. But what Danny did is he wrote an equation like this for, um, for every uh, individual and then developed the statistical mechanics of the ensemble. Uh, and then um, by appropriate assumptions, which I can go into in the question period if you want, um, developed, this is what we would call a Lagrangian rule, where you track every individual. Um, what one wants to do is to go from that to the equivalent of a diffusion equation, developing a, um, a, a, a partial differential integral equation description of the whole ensemble. Uh, and this is like a diffusion equation, but there you see in small print, there's also an integral term because um, although what you do in developing these uh, Eulerian models is usually to shrink down the neighborhood of interaction to an infinitesimal. If individuals are actually censusing a finite neighborhood about, around them, that term is going to remain. It's not going to be a, a, a differential term. It's going to be an integral term. So you don't need those details now. But um, here we're assuming a whole bunch of... Um, homogeneous assemblage of individuals, but real aggregations are heterogeneous assemblages of individuals. Um, and so this led us to think about the role of leadership and collective decision-making in these aggregations in work led by my former postdoc, uh, Ian Cousin, who is now director of one of the Max Planck Institutes uh, in Constance, together uh, with um, uh, um, Jens Krauss and, and Nigel uh, Franks. Uh, and, and what we did, which means really what Ian led, was to develop individual-based models of how fish move, uh, and basically in which they could move, uh, taking into account either their own idea. Um, first of all, they all had a, a particular velocity, their own idea, G, of where they ought to go, where the food was, where the 
predator wasn't, uh, and their relationship either of, of the various ways I talked about before to other individuals. So individuals updated their um, their direction um, at discrete time points based on e some combination, some weighting of their uh, own sense of where they wanted to go and their sense of where other individuals were going. If they were a leader, then they basically paid little or no attention to other individuals. If they're followers, then they um, only uh, paid attention to other individuals. And so we had a, uh, uh, the, the model said that each individual updated its uh, velocity vector by something of this sort, a normalized weighting of their social vector and their intrinsic vector. And the weighting was omega. So if omega is zero, then you're a pure follower. And if omega is large, uh, then you are largely a leader, although you pay as long as omegas, um, well, well, it can't obviously be infinite, um, you're paying a little bit of attention to others. So let me just show you a couple of simulations of what this looks like. So here I'm gonna show you a hundred individuals um, and um, 99 of them are green. They are pure followers. There's one white dot that you can see out on the right. That individual wants to go up and to the right but can't convince anybody really to go with it. So the group, uh, if you gave it long enough, probably would might move up there, but not very effectively. If you increase that to, to five, it does move up and to the right. And here I'll show it to you with 10. Uh, and with 10, the group moves rather rapidly. That's assuming all the individuals wanted to go in the same direction. Now we looked at variants of that that I, I can't, I don't have time to talk about in which uh, we have competition between individuals who want to go in other directions. I will say a bit about that later. But what all this shows is that animal groups can be led by a small number of individuals. These are groups of different sizes. Uh, and um, it, it shows you that by the time you get up to about 10 individuals, no matter how large the group is, the group moves rather effectively uh, towards its goal. Uh, and th this t tells us something about not physical movements, although the, the, this applies to human groups, but um, but attitudinal changes in human populations, um, a small, small number of opinionated individuals can lead the group in, into a variety of directions. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about for the rest of, 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 the, of the lecture, um, and in many cases leading off um, like lemming uh, off of a cliff. And uh, uh, we, we may be moving faster to the cliff, cliff down here in the U.S. than up in Canada, but you're moving in the same direction. In bird flocks, it's been shown in data that birds seem to be, at least in these bird flocks, paying attention to about seven nearest neighbors. Uh, so why should that be? Um, my colleague, Naomi Leonard, with whom I've worked for about 20 years, uh, is a control theorist, and her group looked at what maximized the robustness of the group, which is a public good, and showed that seven was about the number that would maximize that. But I said to her, that's not a sufficient answer because it is a public good. And, and so why uh, why should individual birds um, be able to uh, want to engage in these behaviors in the collective good if it's not in their own uh, behavior? How many neighbors should one depend on more generally? How many leaders, how many followers? What would be the optimum for the group like Naomi showed? But what I was interested in is from a game theoretic point, what would be the Nash equilibrium? Uh, what would happen if every we took into account every individual's own interests here? Um, and there are lessons obviously for cooperation in public goods games. So I had a graduate student, uh, Eleanor Brush, um, who um, in her thesis, and, and work with me and Naomi to ask this question from a game theoretic point of view, allow every individual to do what's in, in their own best interest and see what patterns will result. And we found, or she found that it, um, it's not all that simple, that, um, that depending on the task at hand, it might be seven if it were predator avoidance, but if the animals were grouped together in order to more effectively find group food, you got a different answer depending on the conditions. So this duality between the social optimum uh, and the game theoretic solution 
is fundamental to a lot of ecological problems, but it's certainly fundamental to, to finding cooperation um, in human interactions, uh, and in particular in dealing with the problems that plague our planet. Can cooperation be extended to the global good? Public goods problems are widespread in socioeconomic and ecological context. I already talked about the tumor cells, um, but the, what you see on the left is what motivated uh, William Forster Lloyd two centuries ago to introduce the notion of a commons where you have multiple uses for a particular system. And even within a particular use, you have multiple users. How does this get resolved? How can we achieve cooperation in the collective good? How does nature achieve it? How do lots of little fish uh, band together to chase off the larger fish? Or <clears throat> a lot of uh, starlings band together to protect themselves against um, a, a predatory hawk. William Forster Lloyd's paper was picked up by the man on the left there, Garrett Hardin, who talked about what he called the tragedy of the commons. And he said that the solution to that was mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. But what, what Hardin meant was that individuals should group together, develop police forces and governments that could enforce the rules. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, Nobel laureate in economics, wonderful person, passed away sadly uh, a, a few years ago, uh, showed that you didn't need that in small fisher societies, for example, where that mutual coercion mutually agreed upon could arise from the bottom up as individuals banded together, developed social norms um, that could uh, maintain uh, the levels of cooperation that were needed. It depended on degrees of closeness. So how do social norms of this sort become established? How? What's the role of leadership? How is consensus achieved in democratic societies when you have incomplete information? What's the role of the unopinionated? Uh, and uh, um, Ian and Naomi and I and our groups uh, and, and a number of collaborators published a, a, a second paper in uh, science in 2011, where we looked at Ian's experimental work on animal groups where um, animals were uh, incentivized to move towards particular targets, to the theoretical models I've already talked to you about, and to a variety of models of opinion formation in human groups. Uh, we got a number of interesting results. The, the first was um, that uh, the unopinionated individuals play an important role in developing consensus. So these, this is what I just said, the, the models of human decision-making uh, on top of the models that I've already talked about. And we found that unopinionated individuals were crucial. Just to give you a couple of examples of that, imagine that you have a situation where there are no uninformed individuals <clears throat> and where you have a majority of individuals who want to move in one direction and a minority that want to move in a different direction. But suppose the minority are more stubborn. If you're watching what's going on in, um, in, in Congress in the U.S., today, I mean today, today, um, you will see this sort of behavior where a, a super stubborn and opinionated minority can drive the dynamics of the whole group. And what you're looking at here, the bottom axis is the strength of minority opinion. Uh, and on the vertical axis is how likely the group is to move to what the majority want. And you can see that if, the, if, if you're over at one, which means that the minority is no more stubborn than the majority, then you have a, almost certainly moved to the majority opinion. But the more stubborn the minority, the more likely you are to move to what the minority wants. And we could apply, we're, we're seeing this playing out today. Now let's introduce uninformed individuals, and that's now on the bottom axis. Uh, and then we get an interesting result. Here we, we just chose that, um, that there's a slight stubbornness, 0.3. Um, preference means the preference for sticking with what you've got. Um, and what you see is if there are no uninformed individuals, then you will probably, um, un, 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 let's read that as unopinionated, you will probably move towards the majority. If you increase the number of unopinionated individuals, you're more likely to, um, to move towards what the majority wants because they wash out the influence of the minority. But if you make the number of unopinionated, uninformed individuals larger and larger, you're washing out everything and 
you move almost 50 50 slightly more because you do have some majority individuals um probability of moving towards a majority of goals so there's an optimal number of um un uninformed if you want to uh, maximize the chance of getting what the majority wants so conclusion up to this point public goods problems and common pool resources i didn't make that distinction but um, public goods are things that we all share, like clean air, where my usage of it doesn't affect your ability to use it. A common pool resource is a little different. Um, it, it means that if I, it's something like a fishery or a, or a library, where if I take something out of the system, you can't, you don't have access to it anymore. But these represent fundamental ch challenges, not only in economics and sociodynamics, but also in evolutionary biology. So collective actions needed, and it can emerge from these local actions in order to, to get the, the, the uh, collective good. And this leads to multicellularity and things of that sort. Uh, and the dynamics mathematically play out on multiple scales. Uh, the collective decisions can impose the multiple coercion, the mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. And linking these is key to understanding the management of the common. So just a few words on this before I, I, I finish up. Um, this is a paper that Naomi and I published last year. Um, the psychologist Elka Weber and I published a paper uh, following up on this on the psychology of collective intelligence. But collective intelligence is a public good. Uh, and this was in the lead in, in the first issue of a new journal called Collective Intelligence, which I, I'm on the editorial board, so I recommend it to you. But we're having trouble with collective intelligence because political polarizations on the increase everywhere and threatens democratic governance. Uh, this was uh, produced by the Pew Foundation nearly 10 years ago, um, a, a document on political polarization that's gotten worse since then. And I'll show you to some extent how it's gotten worse. But this is how the, the Pew Foundation laid out public opinion on a, a, on a liberal conservative axis in 1994, you see the Democrats and the Republicans somewhat apart there. By 2014, the split had gotten greater. By 2017, it had gotten even greater. I haven't seen what it looks like today, but I would expect it to be even greater. Similar document, similar graphs um, can be um, produced for the elites, for people in Congress, and they're even more uh, dramatic. This is from Yves Lelks, and shows that the, the, the two groups have moved apart. These are congressional votes. Uh, Democrats slightly to the left, Republicans even more to the right. This The separation has gotten greater. And uh, in a paper, I edited an issue of uh, PNAS, um, which I'll mention a, a, a link to in a minute, a few years, uh, two years back, um, and on political polarization, and Naomi and her colleagues have a paper in there showing how this um, arises by the interaction between um, the popular opinions and uh, and what are called the elites, meaning the congressional figures, and how they co-evolve with each other. Another example, mask wearing and vaccination have raised public goods problems. You all know about that. Reminded me of this guy who says, I never use turn signals. It's nobody else's business where I'm going. That's like people saying, whether I get vaccinated or not, whether I wear a mask or not during the height of COVID is nobody's business but mine. But of course, that's not true because there's a public good involved here. Um, hesitancy about using uh, getting vaccines, highly socially motivated, um, mediated rather. Uh, the, the groups that are vaccine hesitant, you can see Democrats, uh, the least hesitant, Republicans, the most hesitant and their whole spectrum uh, in between of differences. How does this happen? How do these opinions get associated with particular groups and reinforce each other? And you know, if you've been following it, and Canadian politics uh, is the same, that the opinion of the group influences what the individuals do and what the individuals do affects what the groups do. Uh, and these sort of feed on each other and get further apart. And if if you're a Republican congressman now uh, and, and not supporting an extreme point of view, you will get exercised as a Republican in name only. So we published this issue, which I think if you're interested in this topic at all, you'll find um, um, very interesting. There are about a dozen papers in it. 
I co-edited it with um, the political scientist Helen Milner and the economist Charles Parings, uh, as I said, two years ago. Um, scientific consensus is strong on many core environmental issues, but adequate action to address them has been lacking. Not because we don't know what to do scientifically, but rather because of the willingness of people and governments to commit to the collective good and to find and to cooperate in finding solutions that benefit everybody. If you look, and this is an old, uh, but it, nothing much has changed, at attitudes towards climate change, uh, a study carried out comparing US, China, and Sweden, and all of these look the same. Has the temperature increased? Is it our fault? Can we do anything about it? And should we do anything about it? Uh, just focus on one of those. In China and Sweden, very different government uh, set up still, uh, an overwhelming fraction argued that on all of these points that yes, um, there's a problem and we need to solve it. In the US, a majority, but nowhere near as compelling. Uh, and if you look at just the US in 2008, uh, about 51% of the people um, were alarmed or concerned about climate change. That dropped in 2010 um, to about 39%, possibly because of the financial crisis, which caused people to say, um, let's deal with that first, even if it means uh, a little more uh, polluting. By 2016, it was almost back up to where it was, and today, pretty much back up to where it was in 2008. One last example, mask wearing behavior. Uh, anybody who's traveled in the Far East um, and 20 years ago knows that during flu season, there's a lot of mask wearing, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Taiwan, Thailand, uh, and to some extent, Japan, you see at the top, and, and obviously still in COVID, that was the case. In the Nordic countries, mask wearing has never been a tradition in Sweden, Norway, Finland, you see at the bottom. Uh, I don't know where Denmark is. Maybe it's not in the data here. But the um, um, but even during COVID, nobody wore a mask. And then there were a whole other group of countries, um, the United States and Canada, uh, you'll see among them, in which there was a phase transition, going back to what I talked about right at the beginning. How did that happen? Uh, and we did a, 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 a lot of work on that. Um, social warms are key. Uh, we've been working on that for about 20 years. How do they change? Um, attitudes towards foot binding, the most famous example, smoking in public places. There have been lots of changes. Um, and can we change attitudes towards climate change? Paul Ehrlich and I wrote this paper 20 years ago called The Evolution of Norms, where we talked about uh, the stickiness of some norms and how norms can change. In one of her last works, um, Eleanor Ostrom talked about um, changing attitudes by building on her bottom-up local model, um, what she called a polycentric approach. You get cooperation uh, in, in small ensembles, uh, which could be a small number of countries, and then those become foci for collaboration at broader scales. And um, with my student, Andrew Tillman, uh, and uh, the economist, um, Avinash Dixit, we looked at mathematical models, no no, no, no time to talk about uh, these now, but uh, uh, where there was cooperation within groups and pro-sociality towards individuals, um, looking at um, Ostrom's uh, idea there. And finally, um, with um, uh, George Pacheco, my postdoc, uh, Vitor Vasconcelos and Phil Hannum, uh, we extended this to cooperation at the global scales where the only difference is individual nations belong not to one association like the UN, but to lots of different overlapping ones. And we showed that that was crucial uh, for achieving cooperation. On the bottom axis here, the number of, of different associations you belong to on the vertical axis, the probability of getting um, uh, achieving uh, cooperation, basically. So in conclusion, uh, and this really is the conclusion, recall that Complex adaptive systems problems require us to relate phenomena across scales from cells to organisms to collective to ecosystems and to ask these bunch of uh, questions that I raised at the beginning that I won't repeat to you. Um, at all levels, mathematical thinking can address the fundamental problems of complex adaptive systems, unifying disciplines and transferring successes in one discipline to another. This was Wilson's definition of consilience and the National Science Foundation's 
uh, equivalent definition of what they call convergence research. Um, the physicist Dina Stumian, and I thank uh, my colleague Bob Austin for pointing this out to me, gave a lecture in which he said he had a research grant rejected from the NIH. The review said the work is focused on an important system. It's very interesting. However, it seems that the author proposes to do mostly thinking. It's not clear that the NIH should support thinking, uh, is what the uh, and the review said. I'm arguing that we need more thinking, uh, and that um, uh, Galileo said the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Uh, and you remember, I, I think we have reason to continue to enjoy what Wigner called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And with that, I'll thank my various funding sources uh, and uh, thank you all for listening so patiently. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, what a fascinating talk. Uh, <clears throat> um, so we can take questions from uh, from anybody here. Um, you can either put your question into the chat or you can raise your hand and let me know. I'll keep I'll try and keep an eye on everybody on the screen. <clears throat> Okay, Fred. Okay, um, I didn't want to go first, but I'm, um, so so Simon, th thanks for your talk. That was that was great. I, at some point, you said um, you talked about cooperation from individuals um, that they would do knowingly or not, and I thought that was a really important distinction that has uh, that it has impacts on management. If we're trying to manage for a context where competing individuals will have a net positive impact on a common good, on a public good, or if we're managing for developing cooperation as a trade between individuals and to understand what is the, the resilience of these two strategies, right? And uh, uh, is, is it something that, well, I, I thought it was a, an, an important distinction that I, I'm just wondering if it's something that has some clear, um, clear predictions. But so that, that, that's a fascinating question, and and we talk about it to some extent. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to remember to send you a copy of the paper uh, in the paper that Elka 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 is a is a great psychologist, uh, and we we were asked to follow up the the, the paper on um, uh, cooperation as a as a public good with thinking about the psychology of why individuals cooperate. Uh, and there are a lot of related questions that 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 that, that appear there. Um, questions um, such as the the emergence of pro sociality in, in our societies. You know, this uh, this goes back to the classic questions in evolutionary biology about altruism. How does it arise? How does to what extent does it depend on kin? Uh, there are a whole spectrum of levels uh, ranging from kin selection to um, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, to indirect uh, reciprocity. Um, the great baseball player, Yogi Berra, uh, um, is reported to have said, uh, you should always go to other people's funerals or else they won't come to yours. Uh, uh, obviously, that's not direct reciprocal altruism, but you're sustaining a, a social norm, it's, it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with Avinash Dixit, we've uh, I've looked at, and and we're not the first to look at questions of the sort. A number of questions. One, it, it it's easy to show that societies are better off when there is pro sociality, but pro sociality is subject. Pro sociality means caring about others. Uh, pro sociality is subject to cheating. So, for example, in one of our models, um, we do this mathematically, but it, we basically show. Uh, I mean, basically, the explanation of why it works is, you know that you're you'd be better off in a um, um, in a pro-social society. You care about your children, and therefore, it's beneficial to your children's um, fitness to establish systems, for example, of education that will increase pro-sociality. So you can develop, and and the first models I knew of, of this sort were actually developed by the late economist. Herb Guinness. Um, 
so you can show that prosociality can be selected for. Um, so no, let me take a step back and as to what I was saying is obviously if you're thinking about um, the collective phenomena in which um, water becomes steam, the molecules don't care. I mean, this is a, a form of cooperation. Uh, and and, and uh, David Pines, the physicist, um, headed up something called the Institute for Complex Adaptive Materials in which he was interested in these phenomena in materials in which the molecules don't care, but there uh, are structures that emerge. Move a step up to bacteria and the bacterial biofilms. Bacteria, the reason dentists stay in business is because the bacteria um, cooperate to form biofilms. Uh, and to do that, some of the bacteria have to produce extracellular polymers, which serve two functions. One is they are, are quorum sensing tools. And secondly, they form a matrix uh, uh, for, 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 for growth. Um, and uh, I, I don't remember if you were around when um, when my student was was working uh, on the, the, those sorts of models, but we uh, uh, we developed models um, in, in that showed um, under what conditions it this behavior and it, it had to do with the spatial structure um, of. of of, of the matrix would arise. So in bacterial biofilms, you can get this. And moving up the scales, you know, um, in many animals, there these behaviors are built in, and you um, um, probably have been selected for because of the benefits of collective interactions. But individuals are not necessarily doing things, and in most cases, won't be doing things. Now, to what extent are humans different? Uh, you know, it's not just humans who will engage in behaviors to to protect others and and engage uh, in, um, in in behaviors that are governed by the collective, but humans are uh, obviously are special. And to what extent are our I, I, those are great questions, and it's a wide open area for productive research. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Um, I'll read it out here from Paul Francois on political polarization. When looking at the votes, it's highly asymmetrical. Republicans are moving right, but Democrats are kind of staying where they were. So it seems to be rather self-contained on the right rather than coming from interactions with the Democrats. Can you comment on this? Uh, I, yes, I can. First of all, you're, you're almost right. The, uh, and you're basically right. The Republicans are moving faster to the right. If you looked at it, saw that the Democrats are moving to the left. And what uh, Naomi Leonard and her colleagues say, uh, um, uh, in, in, in that um, uh, in that paper is that the Republicans have actually passed the threshold, they argue, from uh, in, in a multiple stable state system from which coming back um, would be um, um, would be extremely difficult. The Democrats are close to the threshold, but haven't crossed it yet. So when I talked about interaction, I wasn't particularly talking about uh, interactions uh, across the spectrum. But talking about the coevolution between the Republican voters and the Republican elites, the Republicans in Congress, the Democratic voters and the Democrats in elite, so they feed on themselves. But of course, there is obviously an interaction um, across the middle, and 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 what you're basically seeing uh, is an erosion of the uh, of, of the middle. Um, so, um, I. I I, I I don't remember, frankly, if they're to the degree to which their model looked at the dynamics of the other opinion. But in, in the inter, I, I I do need to point out that um, in in the whole literature, and the, the best book I know on political polarization is by my colleague Nolan McCarty. But we talk about this a lot in the introduction to that issue. There are really two kinds of polarization. That result, and what does polarization mean? It, to some extent, it, it means um, the collapse of the space of the opinion dynamics to a lower dimensional uh, system, um, where opinions on different issues get packaged together, and you can't 
you can't, for example, um, uh, be in favor of a, a vaccine, a forced vaccination, or or even a vaccination, uh, and and simultaneously um, be uh, opposed to abortion. You know, the, uh, these issues get collect. And the other is, is spreading out on a spectrum, but there, but there's definitely an interaction between Democrats and Republicans, because. Um, it's documented that one should at least think about what is called, what we'll call uh, uh, issue polarization, in which you simply have difference of opinion on different issues, and effective polarization, spelled, spelled with an A. And effective polarization means, um, to make it simple, hatred for people who have a different opinion, uh, re revulsion at the other group. And it's a documented phenomenon. It also may mean associating yourself with individuals of the same opinion but a strong component is 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 a resistance to the other group and we've uh, not just in the u.s but especially in the u.s we've seen this dramatically um and i guess ever since newt gingrich so that's um uh, uh 25 30 years ago so I think um, just looking at the time, oh, we've got uh, we've got a question here from uh, from some from one of our students. But I, I think in the interest of time, we're going to sort of close off the formal uh, seminar part uh, here, uh, and then the students will have additional time with you to to ask questions. Anna, I hope that's all right. I'm going to let you ask your questions sure. in the second part. Um, so I would really like to thank you for a wonderful and stimulating talk. Um, this is not actually my area, so I was just, um, really uh, interested by hearing about all these, uh, all this uh, long history of research in this area. And I think I'm going, I've got some reading planned in my future. Um, so thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I would argue that there's no system you can work on in, in theoretical biology where this notion of complex adaptive systems and emergence isn't going to end up being important. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm going to now 